Hello viewers, my name is Daniel Beseda, and I am presenting a video to you today on the new and revitalized SAT. Now, this past year, the SAT rolled out a brand new exam, which is meant to be more in line with the Common Core State Standards. With that in mind, there are four main components of the math portion of the SAT, with those four components being, first, the heart of algebra. Think of heart of algebra as your linear functions that we find in Algebra 1. The third subcategory, which is Passport to Advanced Math, tends to focus on things that students see in Algebra 2. The fourth category, which is the additional topics in math, tends to include, among other things, geometry and trigonometry. But that leaves one category that students don't often see in our classes, which is a focus on problem solving and data analysis. And that is what this video is going to be all about. What do students need to know about problem solving and data analysis for the SAT? Now, these clips come right from the SAT's website, the College Board website, so all of this is very easily accessible online. But really, the SAT here is looking for students to be ready to answer real-world questions. And certainly, the statistics and data analysis that we do are things that are important for students to know. Now the four main categories included in the SAT data analysis are in a bulleted list. Now number seven here, and one of the things we're going to talk about in this video will be what can students do with two-way tables? Can they do basic things like find relative frequencies and conditional probability? These calculations are very easy calculations, but of course they do require students to understand what a two-way table shows them. The other three items that are included here in the problem solving and data analysis section, number eight, make inferences about population parameters based on sample data. As we'll see later, this means given a bar graph or given a histogram, can the student estimate or find the exact value of the mean, the standard deviation, etc. Number nine is using statistics to investigate measures of center and analyze the center shape and spread. Now that is very similar to number eight, but it does include mean, median, and mode, range, and some variation as well. Finally, number 10 kind of stands on its own and number 10 is about evaluating reports to make inferences, justify conclusions, and determine the appropriateness of data collection methods. Here, calculations are not as important as the interpretation itself. Now, what we're going to do now is look at an example of what students might see from each of these categories. And we're going to begin with a very simple question on two-way tables. Now the two-way table here shows feeding information for boarded pets, cats and dogs, and if they're fed dry food only or wet and dry food. A very interesting topic for high school students. Now the question here asks, what fraction of the dogs are fed only dry food? Now as advanced math students who are working on our masters, we might look at this from the standpoint of conditional probability. However, I would not expect my students to look at it that way, and I would not expect them to look at it from a probability standpoint at all. I would expect them, expect them to look at it as a relative frequency question. If I want to know what fraction of the dogs are fed only dry food, then all I'm going to be looking for is how many dogs are there, as well as, of these dogs, how many are fed only dry food? I'm going to abbreviate that here, the DF dogs, dry food dogs, of course. And if I know how to interpret a two-way table, this is going to be a pretty easy one to solve. The total number of dogs is given over here on the right, and that is going to be 25. And the total number of dry food dogs can be found over here as 2. Therefore, to answer the question, what fraction of the dogs are fed only dry food, the answer would be 2 out of 25, or answer choice B. Now again, nothing too terribly complicated here from a calculation standpoint, but students would 
need to know how to read and interpret a two-way table. Now, continuing with the idea of two-way tables, I wanted to look at a slightly more challenging example of what students might see. Now, this table involves a sleep study, and it has two groups, group X and group Y. And group X is consisting of 100 people with early bedtimes. Group Y is my group, the people who have later bedtimes. And the question here is, if a person is chosen at random from those who recalled at least one dream, what is the probability that that person belonged to group Y? Now, again, this is definitely a conditional probability question, and as advanced students, we would probably look at it that way. But a student would look at this from a frequency concept, or a frequency point of view. And the first thing that I would want to look at here is how many people in the study actually had at least one dream. And to answer this problem, what I would want to do is find out how many of those people were in group Y. And if I can figure those two things out, then it will be very simple to solve this problem. Now, where can I find the number of people that had at least one dream? Well, those would be in the two columns, one to four dreams or five or more dreams. If I look at the totals down here at the bottom, that would be 39 plus 125. Now, if I wanted the numerator, I would need to find the number of people only in group Y that had at least one dream, and that would be the two numbers above, the 11 and the 68. Based on that, I've got 161 people that had at least one dream, and of those 161 people, the number that belonged to group Y is 79. Based on that, and if I conveniently change my miscalculation to a 4 here, I can see that the probability that the person belonged to group Y is 79 out of 164. Answer choice C. And again, this is an example of that number 7 from before, what students need to know about two-way tables and frequency probability. Now, let's move on to a talk on population parameters. This is number eight, where we have to make inferences on population parameters given data. Now, what we've got here is a histogram, which shows the number of apples with a certain number of seeds. And this question is asking us to find the arithmetic mean number of seeds per apple. Now, as we know, an average can be found pretty easily by looking at the total number of seeds divided by how many apples we've got. Now, we're very lucky here. The SAT has told us that there were 12 apples that we're looking at here. Now the question is, how will we find the total number of seeds? And that can be found pretty easily as well, provided we understand how to interpret our bars here. Now, what does this bar here actually mean? It means that we've got three seeds in two apples. In other words, we have two apples that have three seeds each. Now, simple multiplication will tell me that in that bar we've got two times three, or six seeds. I'll repeat that process for each of the other apples, each of the other bars, I should say. And I see here I've got four apples with five seeds. I've got one apple with six seeds. I've got two apples with se seven apples with two seeds, two apples with seven seeds, and finally three apples with nine seeds. If I add all of those numbers up, I have six, twenty, six, fourteen, and twenty-seven which gives me a total here of 71 seeds 
and 12 apples, or an average of approximately 6 seeds per apple? Answer choice C. Now, we'll move on to item number 9, or category 9, which is investigate measures of center shape spread. Now, this question asks us about a blowfish. I'm sorry, a bullhead fish. And I'm not sure exactly what a bullhead fish looks like, but fortunately, we don't need to understand that in order to answer this question. They give us the length to the nearest inch of 21 brown bullhead fish, and they ask us, if we remove the 24, which is clearly an outlier, which will change the most if that 24 inch measurement is removed of the mean, median, and range? And this is a very simple one to do to answer if we understand mean, median, and range. And range clearly is the correct answer here. Range being the difference between the highest and the lowest measurement. Now, originally our range would be 24 minus 8. Given that 8 is the lowest, our range would be 16 initially. However, if we are to reject the 24 from consideration, well, now my highest measurement is 16, and my range becomes 8, which is obviously a huge difference if we reject that outlier. If we think about the mean and the median, neither of those two will change quite as much as the other two, simply because there are so many data points and they are spread very close to the mean, which appears to be around 12 or 13. Thus, the answer is the range will change most if that outlier is rejected. Our final question in the video relates to bullet point 10, which is making inferences, justify conclusions, and determine the appropriateness of data collection. And this is not a calculation question at all. It's totally an interpretational one. This question says, a market researcher selects 200 people at random from a group of people who indicated that they liked a certain book. The 200 people were then shown a movie based on the book and asked whether they liked or disliked the movie. Now, of those surveyed, 95% said they disliked the movie. Therefore, which of the following inferences can appropriately be drawn from the survey result? Now, the best way to do this is just to go through and kind of see which of these answers make sense. Now A says at least 95% of people who go see movies will dislike this movie. And that's not accurate because we only surveyed people who indicated that they liked the certain book. We can't make a general statement based on a limited selection of people. So A is out. Answer choice B says that at least 95% of people who read books will dislike this movie. But we didn't survey people that like reading books. We only surveyed people that liked a certain book. So answer choice B does not make sense either. C says most people who dislike this book will like the movie, but we didn't talk to people who disliked the book. We talked to people who did like the book. Answer choice C is not correct which only leaves D, which states that most people who like this book will dislike this movie. And important to note here is that they did not give us a number, they just said most people. Because the 95% that said they dislike this movie is only a value for this particular survey. We cannot generalize to the entire population and say that 95% of people overall will dislike this movie if they read the book. Well, I hope that this video, although rather lengthy, has been helpful in your understanding of what the SAT is looking for as it pertains to one of the topics in math that we don't always get to study with our students, which is data analysis. You've now seen an example of the four main bullet points covered on the SAT data analysis questions, and hopefully from that you'll be able to adequately teach your students and what they can expect to see on the SAT on April 5th. Thank you for watching and have a great one.